Hi everyone, I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom here on WHS Stores 91.7 FM. So thank you very much for tuning into my show this morning. I have on the line the Honorable Dr. Walter Block, who is going to be joining us for the show today. Dr. Block, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Well, Dr. Block, it's, it's quite an esteemed pleasure to have you on the show because um, you have been quite a contributor to the Austrian and libertarian circles. You are quite a heavyweight in the field, and I wanted to get you on today to talk a little bit about you. Um, for my listeners who might not have heard about you, I know that you are the chair of economics down in Loyola University in Louisiana, and that you're a uh, senior fellow at the Mises Institute. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. And um, I know you've written a plethora of, of uh, scholarly works and articles, and uh, I have many of your books as well. I have The, um, the Case for Discrimi Discrimination. I have The Privatization of Roads and Highways. And uh, also Defending the Undefendable, which I believe you just released the sequel to recently. That's right. There's Defending One and Defending Two now. That's great. And, and you're working on a book now about privatizing the oceans. And thank you so much for your contributions to libertarianism and Austrianism. I, I think it's just fantastic what you've been doing. Well, it's a labor of love. Great. So, so Dr. Block, um, I wanted to start maybe with a, a kind of general case for privatization. Can you talk a little bit about the moral and ethical case for uh, privatization? Yes. Well, uh, the way I see it, there are really two cases. One is the moral and ethical case, and the other is the practicality or the economic case for privatizing things. But let's first discuss the ethical one. Uh, if you and I deal with each other, you sell me a pair of shoes for a hundred bucks. Um, uh, that's ethical in the sense that it's voluntary. Uh, I don't have to buy the shoes from you. You don't have to sell them to me. And the uh, Commercial interaction between us is total voluntary, totally voluntary, and therefore it's licit, proper, appropriate, uh, should be legal. On the other hand, when you deal with the government, uh, if the government has a shoe factory, well, where did they get the money from to make the factory in the first place? Uh, from people, by coercion, through taxes. And uh, where does it get the leather and, and the, the other stuff that, that goes into making a shoe? Uh, again, uh, with money that it takes from taxes. And taxes are compulsory. And uh, the more compulsion we have in the society, the more it rends the social fabric. And the less we have of this, the better. It's immoral, Im improper to have uh, anyone compel anyone to do anything uh, against their will if they're innocent people. And most taxpayers are innocent people. Uh, the only time it's justified to use force is in retaliation or in defense against uh, a person who violates the non-aggression principle of libertarianism. So when uh, you have more and more things in, in the government sphere, you have more and more things in an immoral sphere. And uh, my view is to have less and less in the government uh, sphere. And therefore, uh, more and more things are uh, private and, and ethical. What about the um, kind of economic benefits that come about from privatization and uh, how customers have more of control over what is uh, produced and, and we have less of this calculation problem that occurs within the uh, public and, and government sphere? Well, that's quite right. Uh, the, the socialist calculation debate uh, to which you're alluding, uh, uh, Mises and Hayek uh, criticized central planning, and uh, central planning is... Uh, when the government owns all the means of production, all the capital goods. Uh, you can have private goods, you can have your own tennis racket or your own underwear or your own shoes, but uh, when it comes to the things that make these things, the raw materials and the factories and the capital goods that make these things, only government can uh, own them in, in, uh, in the socialist paradise. And the problem with that is that you really can't have prices because prices emanate from buying and selling. And if the government has to own everything, it can't buy or sell anything. So uh, you're sort of uh, out in at sea without a rudder or without a map or something like that. Uh, the only reason the Soviet Union lasted as long as it did is because they had uh, access to Western prices. In the early years of the Soviet Union, from 1917 to about 1922, uh, they, they ignored these prices and, and just sort of planned without any prices and... Uh, uh, it got so bad that even the Soviets in 21 or 22 had to institute the new economic plan where they 
try to take into account uh, uh, prices, uh, market prices. Uh, they had the Sears Roebuck catalog. They had the Chicago Mercantile uh, Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange. And so they knew what the prices of copper and gold and, and leather and, and oats and barley were. Uh, now, this is central planning, and, uh, it, you know, it, it didn't really work too well. The only reason, as I say, it lasted so long is they did have prices. But if you had the uh, Soviet Union being the entire uh, economy of the world and there were no prices anywhere else, it would be a shambles. And any time the government gets involved in any way, it, it brings a, a little bit of irrationality. Now, the Soviets were totally irrational, uh, but... Every time the government gets involved at all, there's a little bit of this irrationality because you don't have market prices. Uh, in addition to that, uh, in the market, you have this weeding out process. If you're selling shoes and you're doing a good job, you can make profits and expand. And if you're doing a bad job, your customers don't come to you or, or they come to you at prices that you lose money on, you're going to go broke and you're going to have to exit the uh, the shoe business. Whereas if the government were running shoes uh, and they were running it like the post office or anything else, uh, they would lose lose vast amounts of money and uh, uh, there would be no uh, automatic exit. Uh, you know, we still have the post office with us. I mean, imagine if the uh, government were running um, the fast food industry. It would be just a horrible situation. So uh, these are some of the reasons why government is very uh, inefficient compared to private enterprise. This we would expect is a, a matter of uh, apodictic certainty, but there's also empirical, um, I won't say evidence, but illustrations of this, like there are cases where government and private enterprise do something, uh, both do the same thing, like, for example, uh, take garbage away. Uh, and, and for a ton of garbage to be taken away by the government costs two, three, four times as much as a ton of garbage taken away by private people because private people are more efficient because of this uh, market process where they're forced into a bankruptcy if they don't do a good job, whereas the government municipal workers are not forced into any sort of bankruptcy if they don't do a good job. So both on ethical and uh, pragmatic or economic grounds, uh, uh, privatization is vastly to be preferred to government operation. Yeah, I, always, I always like that term planned chaos because I think it really amalgamates what it is that the central planners put into practice when they're um, a accumulating taxation by coercion, by force. Uh, they don't know what people actually want at that point. They don't know what people are willing to pay for. They, they can't allocate resources in a, in a correct manner. And um, so planned chaos is really what central planning is. And, and the individual, the entrepreneur and, and the people who are buying and selling, um, they do have a plan, right? I mean, it's not no plan or, you know, the central planner's plan, right? Isn't it everybody's plan? Well, I think this is a point that Hayek made very, very forcefully. Uh, the idea that the, our friends on the left are trying to say is that if you don't have central planning, you'll have chaos, uh, because planning means central planning, whereas Hayek and, and Mises and other Austrian economists said, you know, that's, that's Looney Tunes. Individuals have plans. You have plans. I have plans. Uh, everyone, unless they're psychotic or whatever, uh, has plans. And the market coordinates uh, the plans that we have. Um, for example, uh, uh, you said I was one of the heavyweights, and I'm trying to lose weight. <laughs> and one of the ways I can lose weight is by eating more uh, rabbit food like, uh, I don't know, uh, lettuce and celery and carrots and less chocolate and cake and uh, uh, candy and ice cream. Well, if a lot of people feel that way, we don't have to go to uh, Obama and say, please, Mr. President, you know, tell the farmers to stop producing uh, the, the chocolate and ice cream and start producing celery and carrots. All we have to do is start buying uh, the celery and the carrots, and the prices will go up in them and the profits up in them, and start uh, buying less or uh, much less uh, uh, chocolate and cake and stuff like that. And then the prices of those will fall, and the profits in those will fall, and then uh, farmers will be led, as if by Adam Smith's invisible hand, which he thought was God's uh, hand, to stop producing those things we don't want and to start producing the things we do want. So the market coordinates plans. You know, we, we have plans to lose weight, and, and the market coordinates that without any central direction. You don't need an orchestra conductor. Uh, we uh, musicians can play alone as long as we've got a, a free market where prices are allowed to indicate scarcities and, and shortages and things like that. 
yeah, I, th I think that's what I appreciate so much about the market is that it really allows people to have a say in what's actually going to be produced and their buying habits is going to actually sponsor what it is that they'd like to see come about in the world and what is to be produced for them. It's really a beautiful kind of very harmonious thing that I see occurring with the market economy. Dr. Yes, there was this uh, guy, uh, what's his name, uh, Bastiat, who was up on the Eiffel Tower looking down on Paris and asking, how does it that Paris gets fed? And he sees people scurrying around, you know, this guy's bringing dough uh, to the baker, and, and uh, they're just being coordinated by this beautiful market process. It's just uh, absolutely wonderful. Absolutely. So, Dr. Block, let's talk about a, a, an, a particular case, which you've written uh, extensively about, um, uh, especially in your book, The Privatization of Roads and Highways. Maybe we can talk a little bit about roads, like what are wrong with the roads and how can we make them better? I mean, this is a constant battle with libertarians. Uh, we, we say we don't want the government producing things, and they say, well, who's going to build the roads? Why, you know, what, what's going to happen without the government intervening in this kind of crucial transportation area? Yes, a lot of people say who will build the roads, and they sort of dismiss libertarianism on that ground because, you know, if we want to privatize roads, and they can't see clear how private people could have roads. And yet my research uh, in the United States goes back to the Revolutionary War times, like in the 17th or 18th century, early, uh, early times of our country, even before the country was started. They, they were private roads then. They would turn pike roads. Uh, some guy would build a road from A to B, and he would charge people uh, for the road, for the use of the road. Uh, he, he would uh, charge more if you had two axles on your wagon than if you had one axle, and he would charge by weight. He would even charge by the width of the wheel. If the wheel was very skinny, your uh, carriage could go fast, think ice skates, but then the ice skates would put ruts in the road. Remember, the roads then weren't concrete. Uh, they were uh, just dirt roads. On the other hand, if your wagon of the same weight had wider wheels, think uh, steam shovels or you know something to damp down the road and, and get rid of the potholes in the road, well, then they would charge you less. So it was a very coherent kind of a system. Uh, not only were roads built privately, but even railroads were built privately. Uh, Henry J. Hill built a whole bunch of railroads, which are long and thin, and sometimes people think if it's long and thin, government's got to do it. Uh, in New York City, the uh, BMT and the IRT were private railroads, underground railroads or subways. Uh, so there was market work. The market. There's no reason why people can't make roads. Uh, they might ask about eminent domain. You know, does the government? You know, suppose there's a holdout. You want to build a road. What city are you in now, Eric? Uh, we're broadcasting out of uh, Yukon Stores. That's in uh, Mansfield, Connecticut, and uh, University okay. of Connecticut here. Okay, uh, I'm in New Orleans, and suppose we want to build a road now from uh, Connecticut to Louisiana. And what is it, oh, 1,500 miles, give or take? I'd say about that, yeah. And I don't know how many people own property between you and me, maybe uh, 100,000 <laughs> if we avoid cities. Uh, and, you know, the idea is how can we build a road? In order to build a road, you have to get property uh, 1,500 miles long. And I don't know, uh, maybe 150 feet wide if you're going to have three lanes uh, each way and a little median in the center, uh, maybe that's 150 feet. So we need 150 feet by 1,500 miles, and there might be, I don't know, just to take a number out of a hat, say a million people own property there. And if any one of them says, uh-oh, you can't build a road uh, on my property, then, uh, you know, uh, he's the holdout, and uh, people think, well, now you can't get a road. But uh, uh, they have our vase, as they say <laughs> uh, in, the, in the movies. Uh, and in my book on this, I go through all sorts of um, uh, uh, scenarios as to how this can be done. Because you don't have to build the road as, as, as the crow flies. Uh, you could build it a little bit on this side or a little bit on that side of the uh, straight and narrow road as the crow flies. Uh, and uh, what we could do is buy options to buy land. In other words, I go to you, uh, Farmer Jones, you're halfway between us, say you're in, um, I don't know, North Carolina somewhere, and we say, uh, hey, Farmer Jones, we want to buy your land. Um, how much are you going to sell it to us for? He says, oh, 10000 an acre. We say, okay, great, but we're not sure we want to buy your land because, you know, <laughs> uh, we'll only buy it if we can get everyone else to agree on this route. 
but we'd like to buy an option to buy your land. So how about uh, selling us not the land, but the option to buy the land, which we can exercise within, oh, three, three years, and we'll pay you 100 an acre just for the privilege of uh, 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 obligating you to sell at the agreed-upon price. And then if we can get uh, enough options, uh, we can just go right through. Or uh, we can go to uh, the people and say, look, here are five routes between Connecticut and Louisiana. And uh, the first group that gets all the people on, on that route uh, agreed uh, will go that way. And we'll pay twice as much uh, as you know the land is worth as farms or whatever it is that you're using it. So these are ways uh, that we could uh, maybe get the road uh, built without eminent domain. Now, my main reason for writing this book was, uh, do you know how many people die on these roads? Uh, it's an incredible number. I think it's like 40,000 a year, and it's been that way for quite some time, right? Yeah, it's a little less than 40,000. It used to be around 40,000. They've got it down to maybe 38 or 37,000. I'm not sure of the exact numbers. I haven't followed it for the last few years. But uh, let's say it's 35,000 people who die on the roads. To just put that in perspective, I mean, how many people died in 9-11? Uh, Only 3,000. How many people died in the aftermath of Katrina? Only 1,900. Uh, not, not that I'm deprecating those deaths. Every life is precious, and when one person dies before his time, uh, that's a tragedy. But here it's 35,000 or more people dying, and, and several tens of uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, uh, get injured seriously enough to be in a hospital. And what's the answer of our opponents on the left who favor road socialism? Their answer is, well, it's not the government's fault. It's, you know, speeding or drunk driving or uh, uh, texting or uh, God knows what. Uh, vehicle malfunction, uh, uh, weather, uh, uh, things like that, speeding. Uh, and my answer to that that I mention in this book is, well, you know, those are only the proximate causes. The ultimate cause is the manager of the roads that's not uh, managing uh, these problems, not addressing these problems. Look, if a restaurant went broke, we wouldn't say that the reason the restaurant rent broke is because uh, it was located in a bad uh, neighborhood or uh, not on a major thoroughfare or that the waitresses were surly or the cooks were lousy or the place was dirty. Those are only proximate causes of the failure of the restaurant. The ultimate cause is the managers didn't pick a good waitress. The manager didn't pick a good location. The manager didn't pick a good chef. The manager didn't get the place clean. Uh, it's the manager, manager, manager's fault. And who is the manager of the roads? Well, it's it's the government. Uh, if we had uh, private roads, um, uh, they would be in competition with each other, just as restaurants are. And restaurants are pretty good. I mean, they're, they're not excellent, uh, although some of them are. But, you know, they're run by human beings. But they're pretty good because of this weeding out process of the inefficient that I spoke about before. If the restaurant doesn't do a good job, they go broke. And the remaining ones are pretty good. That's why restaurants are pretty good. Well, you don't have this with roads. Rather, we have one set of rules made in Washington imposed on uh, all 50 states. Uh, look, maybe it's not speed. Maybe it's the variance in speed. Maybe, I mean, right now on the major thoroughfares, the minimum speed is 40 miles an hour and the maximum speed is 70. And a lot of people do 75. So the, the variance is from 40 or 38 to 75. Maybe instead of having that way, maybe what we should do is on the right lane, you have to do 50 miles an hour. In the middle lane, you have to do 65. And in the left lane, you have to do 80. Now, maybe that would save lives. I'm not sure. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm just postulating this. I'm uh, hypothesizing. The point is that there's no one, no road owner who's now free to institute this policy and then, and then say, well, you know, last year when we had the government policy, uh, a thousand people died on our road. Now we instituted this policy, and only a hundred people died. So we saved nine hundred lives. See, the point is that if we had competition, uh, then you know maybe the rules of the road we could get better rules of the road that would save more lives. But no, uh, government has a monopoly and, and insists on uh, you know the same rules for every road, and uh, entrepreneurial initiative is not allowed to come to bear. So we don't know if uh, if this might save lives or not. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, let's, right now, if you're doing 65 miles an hour in the left lane and, and everybody has to go around you and, you know, switch lanes and that causes accidents, maybe 
they should have a, a rule very strictly enforced, which it's not now, that if you know, somebody passes you on the right, you get the ticket. Uh, so uh, these are just speculations that I'm mentioning in the book and saying you know, that if they were implemented, uh, maybe they would save lives, and if not, then uh, people who implemented it would try something else. But that's what we have in every other industry. People are allowed to you know, try different things and, and try to bring about a better product at a lower price or whatever, and, and yet we're stultified on the nation's roads, and I think that that's a big cause of why we have so many uh, fatalities and so many serious injuries. Yeah, one of the most amazing things about the market is not only is it ethically proper to not use coercion, to not use force, but we get this constant rising of uh, the quality and the standard of living through this market process of, of uh, com- competing between different firms who are trying to att- attract customers. So not only do you have the wonder of liberty being uh, free from coercion, but you also get the prosperity, too. It's, it's, um, it's wonderful how those two things pair together. Yes, well, I think that, you know, we instead of having 35 or 40,000 people a year die on the roads, so we might have, I don't know, I uh, speculate 10,000 people, so maybe 25, 30,000 people a year could be saved. And, uh, you know, we're not even talking about that. We're talking about, I don't know what, Iraq or Ferguson, Missouri, or uh, the Fed or whatever it is, or, or AIDS or Ebola now. Uh, you know, Ebola is... You know, it's a danger, but only a couple hundred people have died from it. And and yet here we have mass deaths. I mean, 35,000 people a year. That, that's just horrible And uh, in, in the United States. And uh, nobody's talking about it. Well, we're talking about it, but we're sort of like a voice in the wilderness. Yeah, it's, it's a staggering number of people who are, it, it, on top of that, they're harmed. Uh, there's also people that are just injured. They're not actually killed. That's a, a staggering number as well. So yes, I'm talk- yes. Yeah, uh, so I'm talking to uh, Dr. Walter Block, and uh, we are chatting a little bit about the roads and about freedom. And uh, Walter Block, I wanted to um, ask you a little bit about your new book, uh, The Privatization of Oceans. I know that we have this humongous island of trash out in the Pacific. Um, what do you think that uh, privatizing the oceans would be of benefit to mankind? Well, the book I'm working on now uh, with my uh, co-author uh, is um, Peter Nelson. Uh, uh, we're going to try to privatize all bodies of water, oceans, rivers, lakes, aquifers, mud puddles, you know, wetlands, uh, swamps, whatever it is. Uh, what we're trying to do is to use the, the same principles that we've been talking about and apply it to bodies of water. Uh, you see, in, in the case of bodies of water, uh, either they're unowned, and then you have the tragedy of the commons, or they're owned by government, in which case you have the tragedy of government ownership, uh, let me just talk a little bit about the tragedy of the commons. Uh, the tragedy of the commons is when we own something in common, we don't tend to take care of it as well as uh, when we own it individually. Uh, for example, um, uh, if there was a meadow that we all could bring our sheep and our, our cattle to, uh, there'd be very little incentive to keep our cattle off uh, lest the, the grass grow down to the roots and, and, and then all the grass disappear. Uh, any, uh, all of us put together have an incentive to do that, but any one of us says, well, if everybody else keeps their cattle and, and sheep off the, the meadow, uh, I'll put my uh, cattle and sheep on the meadow, and uh, my, mine aren't enough to ruin the grass, so I'll just do it. But everybody thinks the same way, and everyone does it. Uh, it's very similar with regard to um, why the uh, fishing stocks are disappearing, because they're not really owned by anyone, or in effect, they're owned in, in the commons. So uh, you have overfishing, uh, the whales are experiencing um, you know, extinction or uh, a risk of extinction. Uh, very similar uh, with cows and, and buffalo. Buffalo were unowned or owned in common, in effect. Cows were owned privately, and cows never came within a million miles of extinction, whereas the buffalo almost went extinct. Because not because of white men's greed, as in this movie, Dancing with Wolves, but rather uh, because they, they were owned in common. So the problem with the Atlantic Ocean or the, uh, uh, I don't know, Pacific Ocean or any of these oceans or really big lakes is they're owned in common, and um, uh, that's the tragedy of the commons. On the other hand, you have the Mississippi River, say, yeah, that's owned by the government in effect. The government runs it. Uh, he who runs it is, in effect, the owner of it. And now you have the same problem as with the uh, roads. You know, the government can't manage its way out of a, a proverbial paper bag, and you get all sorts of problems. The, the, 
the most recent one here in New Orleans was the uh, levees broke. Who ran the levees? The Army Corps of Engineers, uh, who was, the, in effect, the government's agent on, on the ownership of the Mississippi River. Uh, it, it killed 1,900 people, and uh, uh, the, the Army Corps of Engineers did. And uh, it uh, created, I don't know, uh, billions and maybe hundreds of billions of dollars worth of damage in the New Orleans area in southern Mississippi. And for the economist in me, well, you know, I, I sort of poo-poo it. You know, we, we have cash registers for hearts and uh, uh, dollar signs on our eyeballs. Uh, you know, we say, well, that's human imperfection. Uh, but what really rankles me is that those people are still in business. You see, uh, what is it? Um, it to, to make an error is human. We, we all, all make errors. And I don't say that if you had private enterprise running the Mississippi River, there wouldn't be the same era and the same levees broke and the same 1,900 people killed and, and the same amount of uh, damage. Uh, it's possible. It's conceivable. But if that happened, those guys would be broke. They'd be pushed out of, of ownership of the, of the lake or rather the river, the Mississippi River. So you don't have this weeding out process. That's what really rankles the economist in me. I mean, the humanitarian in me is appalled at you know so much death and so much loss of of wealth. But uh, the economist in me just rankles that that these guys are still in business. That's horrible. Uh, if 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 they were automatically uh, out and some other group took over, well, then I'd say, well, you know, maybe things will improve. But things aren't going to improve. If uh, the people who make the mistakes don't uh, get any penalty uh, imposed upon them, let me read you one of my favorite quotes uh, from Thomas Sowell, a hero of mine. He says, It is hard to imagine a more stupid or more dangerous way of making decisions than by putting those decisions in the hands of people who pay no price for being wrong. Well, here's the Army Corps of Engineers. They, they screwed up royally. And they paid no price for it. They're still in business. They, they got more money, tax money, from the government. So this is just a horrible way of, of running the railroad, so to speak. Uh, what we have to do is privatize bodies of water, uh, rivers, lakes, oceans, aquifers, whatever, and let market prices occur. Uh, now they're having the, what is it, the drought in California. And, you know, drought just means a shortage, and that means that the price is too low. The price were raised, uh, people would automatically use less of, of the thing. So uh, what we have here in, in roads and in bodies of water is Sovietization of our economy. Uh, you know, we think that, you know, we're a free enterprise country, but we've got little bits, well, large bits of uh, socialism, large bits of Sovietization of our economy, mainly in the two examples we're now talking about, the roads and bodies of water. Well, Dr. Block, it was so wonderful having you on the show. Unfortunately, we're just about out of time. Thank you so much again for your contributions to libertarianism. Uh, is, are there any articles or, or, I mean, websites that you'd like to um, send out to people? Well, I'm a big fan of LouRockwell.com and the Mises Institute in, in general. Uh, I'm a senior fellow there, and I would uh, advocate that all listeners uh, tune in on that. Uh, WalterBlock.com is my own, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, I don't know what you call it. Something. So if you want more information about me, you can uh, go there. Great. Thank you so much. And to all my listeners, this is the Austrian Circle. Thank you so much for tuning in. And next week, we'll be back with another episode. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye.